chair of uh, the board. Uh, and um, just to remind you that this meeting is um, live streamed. And um, so uh, you, by being here, you are consenting to being live streamed. Um, and if you object to that, then I suggest you leave now. Um, I almost said forever hold your peace, but um, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, also when it comes to speaking, it would be helpful uh, for you to introduce yourselves so that um, people can identify who you are and, and which organization you are representing. Um, so um, item one um, is um, there's a welcome uh, and we need to welcome um, Tony Malloy. Um, Tony, do you want to wave? Um, and Tony is the new chief executive of Merton Connected and you're very welcome. Um, nice to have you here. And I hope that uh, uh, we'll, we'll be able to establish, uh, you'll be able to establish a good working relationship with with all your colleagues involved in, in the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, and we also, whilst on this subject, need to thank Brian Dillon, uh, who uh, was ch chair of Health Watch, who has stood down from the board. So Tony's arriving at the same time that Brian uh, is leaving. I hope there's no um, connection with that, Tony. You've... <laughs> Is it on? Uh, I think we're low on um, connection between Brian leaving and me joining. And Good. I just want to say hello to everyone. And uh, nice to see everyone. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, the item is welcome and apologies. We've received um, uh, apologies from Dagmar Zuma uh, and Bo Fada Nisi. Um, so uh, are there any other apologies? Oh, Brenda, of course. Yes, I was al alerted to that. Um, and Brenda's had some bad news I've heard uh, this afternoon. So uh, I'm sure we will extend our sympathies with her. I think she's uh, had a death in the family. So that's um, understandable why she's, why she's not here. Okay, so item two is declarations of pecuniary interest. Are there any declarations that need to be made? Okay, um, uh, item three uh, uh, is the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, and uh, I spotted um, a couple of errors um, in the um, list of those present. Uh, and I've just ap apologized to Anna, whose first name was missed out um, uh, uh, from those attending. And also Bo, who's not here, has given her apologies. Uh, but uh, her her first name was left out as well, and uh, we have we have taken steps to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Uh, and my apologies to both, um, but but to Anna, uh, I've already apologised. So, um, are there uh, any other uh, issues or inaccuracies that people have spotted in the minutes? Mark, you look like you've no, okay. Um, so can I um, sign those with those uh, amendments? Uh, and we will do a typed version. But um, So what I'm doing is I have amended them by hand uh, and it's just the first page that needs changing. So that's done. Thank you. Uh, and then um, the next item uh, is... Um, tobacco control and um, Barry, you're here uh, to lead that. But before you do, before you kick off on that, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I thought as we were talking earlier, actually, it's very remiss of us not to have included an item updating us on Beat the Street because um, this is a really exciting initiative. It is something that is very much at the heart of health and well-being. Uh, and I think it's a great success story uh, for all the partners uh, involved in this. Um, so could you, if you don't mind, just um, bring us up to date with that? Because it, it really is going remarkably well. Um, so Barry. 
and then do tobacco control as well. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the update on Beat the Street um, so far, we're in week two of the game um, and we have just over 19,000 Merton residents taking part, which is just under 10% of all the residents in Merton taking part in Beat the Street, which is a game to encourage people to walk, cycle and to be travelling more actively, which is really fabulous. Um, of those just under 20,000 people, over 77 percent have registered so we've got their contact details so we can follow up with them on the other assets that we have in, in the borough um, and really importantly 38 percent of them um, are self-reporting to be physically inactive so what that means is they are using beat the street as an opportunity to get more active to improve their health which is fabulous and it's really positive for us and those 20,000 players have traveled 130,000 miles um, so far between them and I know there are many people in the room that are enjoying playing the game and talking to other people about Beat the Street as well. And um, it's um, something that I think we should all be pleased about but we should also be encouraging uh, people to, um, to participate and uh, I've got three of my um, family who are teachers and I've set up a little league table for the three schools that they're teaching at to kind of um, see who's who's winning and uh, it, it seems to have stimulated a bit of healthy competition amongst them uh, and I'm sure that their uh, youngsters will be feeling that healthy competition and encouraged to continue walking. I also um, so spotted somebody as I said to Barry earlier um, not beating the street but cheating the street uh, and this was a mum who had obviously taken her kids to school and got them all to tap in on the way and then as she's walking home and the kids probably encouraged her to walk to school rather than take the car which is great but the idea isn't that you then on the way home get all the cards from all the kids and tap in uh, on the way home um, so when I said that's cheating um, and I, I felt obliged to confront such uh, despicable behaviour, she just shame, shamefully said, yes, you're right. <laughs> so um, so it's good that there is healthy competition uh, and it's great that people are taking it so seriously that they're even prepared to bend the rules. Um, but uh, we won't be encouraging that. But um, And I'm not going to ask people to tell me how many points they've uh, managed to clock up because um, I think naming and shaming would be totally inappropriate but we'll do that at the next meeting <laughs> okay Barry um, tobacco control and stopping smoking and vaping thank you um, and just to start with uh, clearly uh, smoking is the leading course cause of preventable disease and illness uh, across the UK really strongly linked with equality and health inequalities and disadvantage and so tackling smoking within the borough requires a real strong multi-agency response so really welcome the opportunity to talk to the health and well-being board this evening um, but clearly this is not just a Merton issue this is a national issue tackling smoking uh, and the government have commissioned an independent review of um, the government's ambition to be smoke-free by 2030. That uh, the Khan review uh, shows that we are likely to miss that smoke-free 2030 target by about seven years. So we're waiting for the government response to the Khan review, which is due in the next coming weeks, mm -hmm. which is uh, really important for us. I'll split the paper into three component parts. So we'll talk about smoking, we'll talk about vaping, and then finally tobacco control. So the first part of this is around smoking. And so what we can see is that people who smoke nationally and in Merton is declining, which is positive news. And what we can see is that within Merton, um, there are about 12.8% of our residents who smoke. Um, so as well as the actual prevalence, what we can see and the impact of smoking cost uh, smoking and tobacco is very expensive so what we can see in the report is that an estimate that a smoker who smokes 20 cigarettes per day is spending about four thousand pounds a year on tobacco so that's a significant part of income that's being spent 
Um, the impact of smoking, um, I don't think I need to go through in lots of detail with the board this evening, but it is one of the leading preventable causes of death in England and causes lung cancer, respiratory illness and cardiovascular disease. And it has a significant impact on communities across the borough and on the NHS. Clearly, there are a huge number set out in the report of admissions that are smoking related. Um, and this has a wider knock on on the effect of longer hospital stays by those people that are in our hospitals. But as well as looking at the numbers and the crude numbers of smoking, we must look through that equity lens. Um, and so we know that smoking rates are higher in areas of deprivation, in routine and manual occupations and those living in social housing. And really shockingly, uh, smoking in pregnancy is five times more common in most deprived groups compared to the least. So there's lots of opportunity for us as a board to come together to tackle that inequality across the borough, which reflects national inequalities. So looking at stop smoking support that we have, there are a number of services um, that are uh, able to support Merton residents and people that work uh, in, in the borough. Um, some of these are local, some are regional, and some of them are national, but the evidence is really clear, and that is that you're more likely to quit smoking if you get specialist support and advice. <laughs> so the report sets out the, the, the jigsaw of services, so you can see One New Merton, that's the service that we commission within Merton Public Health Team, and that's a tiered stop smoking service with self-care, brief support, and specialist support available to our residents. There are regional programs, so Stop Smoking uh, London uh, works to complement the local offer, which is really important, and that service offers seven days per week support to Londoners, and we within Merton Public Health contribute towards that particular program. Mm -hmm. And the NHS, I've mentioned the impact of smoking onto the NHS, but the NHS is making a significant contribution towards supporting people to stop smoking too. And it's fabulous to see the rollout of the Ottawa model uh, which is supporting those people that are admitted to hospital, smoking at time of pregnancy, or in specialist mental health services. So there's significant investment going in from that side too. So I'll move on to the second part, which is the vaping side of the report, colleagues. <clears throat> um, and what is, again, really clear in the evidence um, is that vaping is at least 95% less harmful than smoking over the short term and medium term. It's a really important key message that we need to get into our communities. Clearly, we need more research on the, the, the longer term impact of uh, vaping, particularly on those who have never smoked. Um, and vaping for those who have been vaping over a longer period of time. But while vaping can and does help people stop smoking, it is not harmless and it's not for young people under 18 years of age. And it's illegal to sell nicotine vaping products to anyone under 18 or for adults to buy them on behalf of under 18s. <clears throat> When we look at the data, and it's set out in the report, so I won't go into it too much detail, we can see that vaping amongst children and young people is largely experimental, but there has been a growth in, in recent years. But most people who have never smoked are also not currently vaping, so it's really important that we identify and we recognise that from uh, our young people. Um, but we spoke about the, the cost of smoking um, to uh, the, the, the wallet, the pocket, um, but there's also a cost of vaping to the environment. So what we can see is that the popularity of vaping products has increased significantly with uh, vapors, around 15% of vapors are now using disposable vapes compared to the refill, refillable tanks. Um, and they contain a, a battery and it's a plastic device and there's an estimated over a million single use vapes are thrown away every week in the country. So there's a significant environmental impact too. Moving on to the third part around tobacco control, public protection. Uh, really pleased that we've got Calvin with us tonight as well to, to, to support the paper. Um, and trading standards uh, do proactive work. They do intelligence led work, which includes sampling and testing of goods. Um, and they respond to and investigate complaints uh, and intelligence from, from local people. Um, and the paper sets out some real strong successes of trading standards. So from five complaints in 22-23, they were able to seize 115 vapes and send 3,000 vapes back to the supplier for disposal for not meeting the required safety standards. 
Um, and the team also works with the Metropolitan Police Service um, and they carry out significant numbers of underage test purchases um, and uh, are looking in the next financial year to deliver an intelligence-led initiative where they target all retailers of inhaling, nicotine inhaling devices in the borough and provide proactive advice and support. Um, as well, and as well as the vaping, trading standards have a, a role around tobacco, and they work in the area about potential sale to children and young people, so underage sales, but also the supply of illicit and counterfeit tobacco, um, which is often linked to organised crime. Um, as well as the enforcement side of things, trading standards colleagues also deliver bespoke Do You Pass training, which uh, works with retailers of age-restricted products, such as uh, tobacco and vapes, and they do uh, provide training materials, signage and refusal logs. Um, next steps for us, we have a Merton Smoking Cessation Tobacco Control Steering Group with an action plan to identify across the three themes that we, I've touched on already. There's some really exciting and really important pieces of work that we're piloting across partners at the moment around working with those residents in social housing so that we can support them to be aware of and then access those stop smoking services, whether it's the locally commissioned, the London or the NHS uh, delivered services. And we're going to do some aware, insight, awareness and educational programs with children and young people um, around the harmful health risks of vaping for those that do not smoke. And as part of that, it's really important that we listen to and engage with young people. So delighted that we've got Anna with us again this evening at the board. Um, so I've taken us through the paper very quickly. Trading standards are also delivering some specific vaping project uh, projects uh, in the coming year. Mm -hmm. um, more do you pass training and some more underage sales. So perhaps I can hand back to Councillor McCabe for the discussion. Well, thank you. Um, and um, I think that this is a, a, a very comprehensive paper, Barry. Congratulations on producing it. Um, I'm delighted, um, and I should have welcomed Calvin um, when I was welcoming everyone else, but um, I knew that you would be speaking shortly. So, um, But I, I think I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell us uh, what your department is doing, um, because I think this is something that um, crosses um, uh, departmental boundaries, and we all need to, to work on this because it is such an important issue. So if you can give us a a quick update and also what's planned, which was touched on in, in Barry's introduction and in the report itself. Do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, Please. thank you very much. It's um, Calvin McLean. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Protection, which covers uh, the Trade and Standards Service. And um, we've welcomed the opportunity to work closely with our public health colleagues on uh, the uh, smoking cessation and tobacco uh, control steering group. Um, alcohol, sorry, tobacco control for training standards is, has been going on for a long time. Um, it's mainly focused on finding those people who are selling to underage uh, people, particularly school children. Obviously, there was a time it used to be 16 um, was the age limit, and, 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 it, and it, the age limit rightly raised to 18. And but what we try to do now, rather than uh, just uh, having blind test purchase operations as we traditionally used to do throughout the sort of holiday periods, is trying to build up an intelligence picture across the borough of premises that are more likely, number one, to sell to children who are underage, that we try and be a little bit more spontaneous because they all tuned into the fact that it's likely that test purchasing operations would happen in school holidays. So we're trying to look at other ways to do that. Um, but also the work we do now around vaping as, as the new thing, and as as has been mentioned, uh, vaping is harmful to people who are under the age of 18, and rightfully so, it's uh, it's illegal to sell or to buy uh, an adult to buy vaping products for young people. Um, and we're not just focusing on uh, retail outlets. We do know that there are some websites that are selling directly to children uh, through uh big retailers who I won't name, this is being uh, uh, recorded and streamed, but through big retailers who distribute and, and people are getting them delivered to home. And what we're trying to do is work nationally across the trading standards uh, sector to see what more we can do. And there's lots of really good practice that's going on across the country, particularly in places like Greater Manchester, 
and the West Midlands. Uh, so the good thing I think I could say is the amount of uh, premises that are selling tobacco products to young people and being caught is decreasing. So the message is getting out there. It's certainly becoming more taboo. Um, and there are fewer young people taking up smoking, as, as Barry has said, but the vaping is now becoming a bit more of an issue. So um, our focus really is going to move to an intelligence led model where we can build a profile across the borough, uh, looking specifically at online sales and what we can do around that, ensuring that there's education out there has been mentioned in the paper, that retailers know what their responsibilities are. Um, to ensure we can safeguard uh, people as much as possible. And that's not to say we can catch everything, um, but I think the uh, the multi-agency Mer uh, Merton steering group is certainly um, helped to bring it all together and ensure that the uh, left hand knows what the right hand is doing. I think that's all I can say for now. John. I thought it was a really good report. My name is John Morgan. I'm the um, Executive Director, Adult Social Care, Integrated Care and Public Health. I thought it was an excellent report. I've read it a number of times, of course, but I read it again tonight and I just had one the question to myself for you, of course. Section 2.7.2, I was really interested in the pilot around um, pe targeting people in social housing, but I did wonder what we've done with the RPs, the, uh, the, 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 the housing providers. Clarion, we've got tw about 12,500 people in social housing. Clarion, our largest provider, there's 6,500 people in Clarion properties. Are we doing any work with them so that they can support us? It would be in their benefits and ours, but are we doing any work with them? <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, yes, we are. We're doing lots of work uh, with those organisations. We're working to promote those that the, the jigsaw of stop smoking services, but also looking to train those those members of staff that working in the community to deliver brief interventions and advice, then signposting people onto services. And really, uh, fantastically, from Clarion, they are also they've accessed some funding to deliver a a a stop smoking pilot delivered by themselves so we're making sure that we're working with them on those protocols to make sure that they align with what we're doing mm -hmm. so lots that we've done already and lots more what we want to do going forward on training frontline staff hi <clears throat> sorry um i'm mark Crillman. i'm the place executive for uh, the Integrated Care Board, so uh, the NHS lead. Um, so again, fantastic, fantastic report. <clears throat> and I'm not sure you can answer this. It's probably something I need to go back and answer. It's just around the rollout of the Ottawa, because actually it, it, it feels like uh, when people are in hospital, you've got a real opportunity to then, as they leave hospital, make sure that they're plugged into the right support services. And then I suppose the other thing was just about the role of the voluntary sector, because often when we're talking about inequalities, et cetera, it's community organizations that have the, the have the kind of access into those communities. And actually, are we kind of mobilizing the voluntary sector as much as we could do? Uh, Councillor Jennifer Gould. Oh, sorry, were you? Sorry, just right. to just to Okay. Uh, just to respond to Mark, um, yes, there was, yesterday there was the, the national launch of the Spoke Free NHS network, a real strong opportunity with 350 uh, people across the country, and we're expecting the future funding to be confirmed in the coming days, which is really positive for us. Ottawa Models got some real good success already across the region, and there's more we can do. Um, really importantly that those voluntary and community sector providers we've worked incredibly closely over the last three years through the pandemic response and thinking through how we uh, recover from COVID-19 so again we've got some fabulous foundations to work on around those public health risk factors so smoking alcohol inactivity and food and diets there's definitely more that we can do 
and but the, the future funding for Ottawa, which is an automatic conversational brief intervention for those people that smoke in acutes, smoke in a time of pregnancy and in mental health settings is a fabulous investment. And that's the, the right groups thinking through that equity lens that we must target for our stop smoking support. Right, sorry, I'm forgetting people's names here this evening. Laura. Laura, how could I? <laughs> Actually, I mean, one of the questions that I wanted to put was to GP. So this provides the perfect opportunity. Off you go. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, so I had just two questions. Councillor, in relation to the paper, um, but yes, I think it is very, as a GP, this is, I, I think, agree, an excellent paper, and, and um, I found it really useful reading it. I wondered in section four, was a reflection on the services and the, the, the volume of activity over recent years, there was that big uptick in, um, in 2021. Did that reflect increased investment at that time, or were things done differently, and what learning might there be from that to continue to to drive that level of activity because the outcomes were similar so the success rates were the same so by doing more more people gave up smoking so I thought that was was really interesting um and thinking about the Ottawa model absolutely that sounds brilliant um at the beginning of recovery from the pandemic there was a lot of talk about prehabilitation for patients who were waiting longer for for surgery and were, were on waiting lists and I guess that's another real opportunity isn't it when people are in hospital or presenting to maternity services that's that's one time that you have an opportunity to institute change but we hear a lot about how there's more people on waiting lists for surgery than ever before and I guess that's an opportunity thinking about that holistic um model that you were mentioning Barry with physical activity smoking alcohol um to really get people in the best possible shape while they wait for their operation um and a much better outcome if they do stop smoking so is there any emphasis or, or focus on that area and I suppose the part that leads on to that which is perhaps what Councillor McCabe was alluding to is that um the way that it, those pathways join up for patients whether they're in outpatients, in the acute hospital, or in the community, how they do they all have the sort of access that doesn't mean they're always having to see the GP because sometimes it's difficult to get a GP appointment. And we have some great services in our practices in Merton, including the rollout of health and wellbeing coaches, which is a new role, who've been really helpful with smoking cessation for those patients who do present to primary care, but actually even better if there are direct routes into the services that are on offer without, without needing to come to the GP so the GP can be a re reinforcing role or signposting role for those other services. Ah, there we go thank you Laura um, on the first point um, the there was no additional investment during the pandemic in stop smoking services, like many other services, we went to telephone based support, um, which showed a great number of increases. But at the same time, there was lots of talk through the pandemic about the risk of smoking causing more severe COVID-19. So there was probably lots more people talking about the impacts of stop smoking and why it's a good time to quit smoking, lose weight, become more physically active and physical activity, connecting with other people when we were allowed to, clearly really important. Prehabilitation is a really important point, and we did some work through Better Health Merton, which was an umbrella brand for the public health risk factors, um, which was driven by an email from our, our primary care colleagues about prehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, and so any opportunities that people have to improve the pathways to embed smoking within those pathways would be welcome. And that refers us back into recommendation A, a of the report to member organizations to really actively seek out opportunities to promote stop smoking and embed stop smoking conversations and support into your pathways whether it's social workers whether it's primary care whether it's voluntary sector whether it's schools and colleges across the borough so there's a huge opportunity for us to do more and just to follow up laura your anticipated question from me was was not what I was um, wanting to ask um, oh that's an interesting point because I actually think um, having been 
um, using um, GPs and um, hospitals um, just recently are far too much. Um, the, the service from both is excellent. Um, my question was, um, and I, I've had a real passion for smoking cessation. Um, it, it got my mother. Um, she died uh, from a smoking related disease and um, she suffered from COPD for the last few years of her life and it wasn't a pleasant sight. Um, she stopped smoking when a doctor looked her in the eye and said, if you don't stop smoking, you are going to die. Um, it was a very stark message, but she came out and she stopped. Now, I don't know if that goes on or whether that's good practice. And, and I suspect that there will be kind of balancing act between nagging and going too far and offending patients, but getting that really important message across. And um, I had the, the privilege of working in the field of um, smoking cessation for seven years. I, I worked with people like Sir Richard Doll, who uh, first established the link between smoking and lung cancer, uh, extraordinary uh, man. And um, I worked with some great people, including, I think, Frank Dobson, who introduced the Tobacco Advertising and Sponsorship Bill. And um, when I first went to see him uh, and suggested that we should ban tobacco sponsorship, uh, I can recall lots of people saying, oh, you'll never achieve that. Um, that won't happen, not in my lifetime. Well, it did. Uh, and, you know, advertising bans and all the other measures that came into play, smoking in public places, um, smoking on public transport, all of those things incrementally uh, have made a big difference. So my question was, is, um, are you still doing it? Are you still being blunt with people when it's appropriate and necessary or do you find yourself having to hold back um and i'd be really interested in the answer to that question uh, so sometimes i'm blunt certainly and all gps will have a slightly different style i think one of the challenges is that now there's so much to do in the space of any given gp consultation that finding the time to also have those brief interventions around things like smoking, physical activity, alcohol, there are so many of the different things that you want to address when you see those patients. Um, but we know that GPs can be really powerful. So it's interesting, your, your story from your mother is not an unusual one. And it's about capturing people at the right moment in that cycle of change. So you might might be someone you know very well and you see very regularly. And they say, and I know what you're going to say to me, doctor. You're going to tell me I've got to pack in the fags. And you sort of say, yes, I am going to say it and I have to say it again. But one time you might say it and there might be something different that means that at that moment they're ready. And I think uh, where we're fortunate now is that we have a range of services, both within and without the practice, so that we can signpost. And I have found things like having the health and wellbeing coaches incredibly helpful because rather than it just being nagging and explaining the risks, because I think most people know the risks now, it's a very tangible offer of actually, here's someone who's willing to work with you over a six week period. If you're ready to stop, they're going to help you do it and we can I can book you in today and you can see them and take that forward. So I think it's a little bit of nagging, a little bit of being blunt, but it's about having the right offer that moves someone from I'm ready to stop smoking to I do stop, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, but I suppose the other thing, and I think this is maybe something about that embedding in all aspects of our work at all times, is I wonder if smoking has slightly gone off the boil, that actually we, we know that smoking rates are decreasing. We see fewer people smoking. It's, you know, because of all the things that you've just described, the tobacco advertising, the public smoking bans, all of those things have made an enormous difference. So I wonder if perhaps for some professionals, it doesn't feel quite as urgent as it once did. And we need to, I suppose, um, reignite that sense of urgency to bring it back because it's just for those patients who are smoking it's just as harmful as ever it was and of course it's such a huge inequalities issue so so by you know targeting those people who are smoking we will make a huge difference um to their health so 
Um, I welcome the paper and I think there's 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 exciting work to be done to actually, you know, make sure that it really is embedded in everything we do. Thank you. Um, um, but I think if there if if there are people uh, in uh, in the sort of on the clinical side of things who are uh, thinking that, you know, that this is something that we've we've already achieved, then I would suggest they read para section three of this report, which states clearly that smoking kills 143 people in Merton every year. Um, and of course, they could then go on to the three two, which says that in 1974, Forty-five percent of the population smoked, compared to fourteen percent now. So you know, maybe there is this. You know, we've we've done it. Um, but you know, for those one hundred and forty-three people and their families, that's an absolute tragedy and an avoidable one, and the single biggest cause of um, you know unnecessary death, um, plus all the illness and all the costs of the NHS. And then the other thing that always strikes me as being so important is paragraph three four um the average 10 a day smoker spending 40 pound a week two thousand pounds a year or if they're smoking 20 a day which isn't unusual um then it's four thousand pounds a year now at the time when people are telling us that they're having to choose between eating and eating what's that doing um, and if we could help people, and it shouldn't ever be nagging, they have to be in the right frame of mind. Um, but if we take every opportunity um, and and really look at those figures and look what a difference that could make to the lives of families that are really struggling and maybe on benefits and you know addicted because it is a really powerful addiction and we have to see it as that. But um, I think we we all have to redouble our efforts. And for me, um, you know, every one of us has to put our shoulder to the wheel. Jennifer. Hello, yes, uh, Councillor Jennifer Gould. Thank you very much for all of the uh, the reports. Very welcome and the detail involved in those. Uh, very interesting to hear that there is a lot of work going on to stop the uh, people taking up smoking. My one concern, um, primary concern, and it should be a priority, I think, is, is mums who are smoking. I heard there was work uh, going on through the NHS in hospital, but obviously before that stage, actually preventing mums um, taking up smoking, I think we really should be doing more uh, or as much work as we can. If there is any more um, you can outline to... Um, help me understand that there, there is that is happening. I would be very pleased to, to hear that. Um, as to the, the vaping, again, that's very concerning. Obviously, the packaging and the advertising of these vapes is all, all um, uh, sort of, it's all, all towards uh, encouraging children to take up um, vaping. I wonder uh, if, if there are ways we can nip the addiction in the bud, as it were, looking at the successful smoking cessation, if there are ideas we could use there, and also around um, licensing. Um, you know, it, there's a licensing act. Could that be, be looked at to protect, uh, for the protection of children from harm? If there's, um, maybe that's something we could be looked at as well. Thank you. We've got some, um, I'd like uh, to bring Anna, Anna in at some point, but do you want to respond to Jennifer's questions? Sorry, yes, of course. Um, my understanding is that the midwives within the, the borough are having brief interventions and having conversations about stop smoking, um, <clears throat> but there's definitely more we can do to support them and making sure we've got those links between those local stop smoking services and the NHS. But council, absolutely, it's a, it's a really important group which we've identified in the report for future work, because that's really important to us. On licensing, it's probably over to to Calvin to respond to that particular point. Calvin, thank you, councillor. Um, <clears throat> vaping itself is not a licensable activity under the Licensing Act two thousand and three, um, but if you have premises that are selling alcohol by retail and also selling tobacco products. If they're selling tobacco products, we can say that those licensing objectives of 
protect children from harm and crime and disorder uh, are being undermined and yes action can be taken but there is no licensing regime currently for tobacco products hopefully that answers your question thank you anna Awesome. Um, but yeah, just to uh, mention the point that you mentioned about um, advertising, I think that's a really important point, um, to be quite honest with you. Um, for instance, we've done advert, we've done um, focus groups of young people in terms of unhealthy advertising, in terms of like food. Um, and they have said that, you know, advertising is a really huge factor that does contribute to obviously young people purchasing products. So I do think that your point that you raise is very important. And I, I do think that we can do much more work together, you know, as a collaborative um, to ensure that you know it is an it is an issue that is raised amongst young people hence why um currently we have a group of young people called the under 18 um health and well-being champions which is starting up um in obviously the public health team and what we aim to do is touch upon different elements of health and well-being so one being smoking one being mental health one being exercise for example and one of which is healthy eating the reason why um, i mentioned mental health health healthy eating and exercise is because we conducted a survey um that we gave to under 18 covid community champions and they have said that those are their key three priorities so you know in terms of like smoking i do think that there's an element where we can link smoking and mental health together because it is at the end of the day very important to link different health and well-being priorities together because obviously they are very linked and the impact obviously mental health you know in terms of smoking behaviors that can also impact exercising um studies have shown that um the more a young person exercises obviously that benefits their health in general you know and i think that you know in terms of the sessions that we host for young people i think the the more awareness we raise in terms of that you know positive messaging we can do a lot especially in terms of smoking, mental health, healthy eating, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to outline when I was reading through the report, it's just, it it, sh it shocked me like in like a lot when I was looking at vaping, because I was like, oh, you know, it, it really shows me statistically how much of an issue it is, to be honest with you. And I think that, you know, it's a really huge issue that we can touch upon in, you know, future sessions we have with young people especially that we are going through the phrase of recruiting more under under 18, sorry, health and well-being um, community champions. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a ton of work we can do together and especially with, you know, your side of your team as well. Um, so yeah, I just really want to see a lot of collaborative work that, you know, would be happening in the future. And yeah, you know, I, I really do see the point that you've mentioned about, you know, the element of advertising because it is a really huge thing to be quite honest with you um especially me talking with you know focus groups of young people you know me talking one-to-one -one with young people it's such a huge thing um so yeah you know I just wanted to say that as a public health team we're doing a lot of work not just on smoking and you know vaping but touching upon all the health and priorities you know of young people because that is very important at the end of the day um but yeah thank you to... thank you Anna um Cy so um, I couldn't see your hand up, so forgive me for not calling you uh, earlier. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Hi, it's uh, Simon again, Surrounding here, uh, GP in Merton, primary care provider representative. I mean, Laura's already made some um, excellent points. I mean, the only things I would add are that in terms of making the best use of GP time beyond what we do within consultations, it's a different world now with social media. So sometimes there are other ways where which GPs can potentially deliver that message and have a big impact across a larger group of people so that we, we should also consider other channels in terms of how we might communicate that message. From an organisational change perspective, I think the biggest difference and changes that we're seeing in primary care are through primary care networks. So with the new roles that Laura's alluded to, such as health and wellbeing coaches, for example, um, only last week, my health and wellbeing coach came and spoke to me and said she wanted to have a, a carbon monoxide testing machine because she would like to do some opportunistic smoking cessation advice while she's seeing people. And whilst we may not always see every patient, sometimes they will be discussed as part of a more holistic review of all their health and care needs, where we can input alongside whatever else it is that's stressing them out, whether it's housing, uh, you know, whether it is their mental health whether it's some of the health needs also, but it's more about having that sort of integrated approach, making the best use of the wider primary care team. My only other question, just in terms of the data in relation to quit rates is, do we know what the differential rates are across the borough, considering things like deprivation? Do we know what the potential barriers might be for different populations? 
given that the, given that there is a higher prevalence in the deprived, more deprived part of the borough. Do we have that? Thank you. Data? Thank you, Sai. Um, and Barry, do you want to answer that specific question? Yes, we do. We do have the smoking rates uh, and smoking prevalence is higher in the wards of the east of the borough. But in terms of the quit rate, sorry, Barry, do we know what the differential quit rates are? Uh, we've got them, so I, I, I'll have to pass them after the meeting because I don't have them with me. Thank you. Could we circulate those to the, that information to all members of the, the board? Um, there's one thing that I wanted to um, take up, and this is the sort of the Ottawa model, because having spent too much time in the last month um, in hospital settings, um, I'm really dismayed when I see people in a hospital, sometimes in a hospital gown with their backsides hanging out, um, going out for a, a smoke. Uh, and I know it's supposed to be a smoke free area, but it still seems to be going on. And I wonder whether with all the pressure that there is within hospital settings at the moment, whether that's something that has been pushed to one side because people just I mean Laura you mentioned you know the time that, uh, and the restriction there is that what's going on I mean if we're putting money into it um, then are we and are we producing um, metrics that show how many patients have come in that are smokers how many have been offered smoking how many have been referred when they're leaving the hospital to um, pharmacies to continue their uh, the efforts because it is such a, an opportunity and if it's an opportunity lost it might not come round again until it's too late so is there any information that you could unearth for us Mark on, on that one it's coming yeah there you go um not to hand. I mean, one of the things that I want to take away is actually just in our local trust, the rollout of the Ottawa. So how far have we implemented that at St. George's and uh, Epsom and St. Helier? Because uh, I think Laura's right. There's a real, uh, we've got a really exciting opportunity here, haven't we? Because actually, if we can collectively kind of uh, not reinvigorate, but invigorate our activity and make every contact count, then actually that, that's something really important. So I'll take that question away. I also will take the question away around um, uh, people smoking on hospital grounds, because I think it's, it's a valid point, uh, uh, but I think it's probably a practice that goes on pro pretty much every hospital in the country. You'll see people standing outside having a smoke in their gown, and I wonder, locally maybe we could do something about that the other thing that i was going to is just pick up on anna's point is that is that i was a smoker um and the thing that that i wish i'd never done was pick up my first cigarette or indeed you know nowadays it would be vape and uh what we need to do is make sure every contact counts around those that do smoke and helping them stop but actually we also need to make smoking that for a cigarette really unappealing don't we and I think what you were talking about advertising or getting into schools etc cetera, etc cetera, we need to think that one through as well Mark, are there any more questions or contributions that people uh, would like to make Calvin can I just ask one question you talked about intelligence is there any intelligence uh, nationally probably um, more than locally I would hope um, which suggests that maybe um, outlets that are selling vaping are perhaps providing other substances as well I've I've seen we, some of that locally actually yeah we do know that anecdotally and when raids of these premises where we suspect things are happening uh, happen, uh, you, we tend to find other issues, uh, usually uh, relating to uh, drugs. Nitrous oxide is the other big one. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in the media this week around nitrous oxide and the government's plans to ban the consumption of nitrous oxide, which, which isn't currently um, illegal at the moment. So nitrous oxide and other drugs, as well as 
um, uh, modern slavery issues and um, people have been trafficked into the country working inside some of these premises. So yes, um, when we do these uh, visits, these raids, um, often it's the tip of the iceberg in comparison to the other things that happen in the premises. Thank you. Well, I think we could go on uh, about this issue all night. Um, it's something that I, I sense has the support of uh, the entire board, but we do need to um, consider um, the um, the recommendations which are set out on um, page nine of the agenda, um, and um, they are recommendations A, B, and C. Um, are they agreed? by the board yes All right okay that's very good thank you thank you very much uh, I, I think um this has been a, a, a useful discussion thank you for the paper okay so the next item is um health and well-being strategy report and rolling priority options and that's is it Julia that's going to lead on this? Barry, your um, best supporting actor, is that is that what's going on here? Okay, Julia, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So I'm, a, um, I'm Julia Groom, and I'm a consultant in public health with uh, the Merton Public Health Team, and I'm here on behalf of um, Dagmar Zoina. Um, so... What I wanted to present tonight was a, a bit of an update on the Merton Health and Wellbeing Strategy and options for rolling priorities for the next year. So I was just going to say, for those who have been involved in the Health and Wellbeing Board for some time, you might be familiar with this, which is the... Um, the, the the strategy for 2019 to 24, Healthy Place for Healthy Lives. Um, this was um, produced um, really to focus on the wider determinants of health, um, those that, that influence our health. So the air we breathe, the environment, our schools, workplaces, our homes. Um, and uh, it builds on evidence that was produced by uh, Michael Marmot in his review of health equity 10 years on. Um, it also had a number of cross-cutting and underpinning principles, um, which are focus on tackling health inequalities, focusing on prevention and early intervention, um, particularly health in all policies, which is very much about how we address health equity and sustainability together when we're looking at, at um, the work of our organisations. Um, community engagement and empowerment, and experimenting and learning, as well as think family. So in everything that the, 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 um, or the strategy focused on took a, a life course approach. Um, now, the strategy was finalised just before the pandemic um, uh, arrived. And so rightly, the focus of the board shifted to uh, the emergency response to, um, to the needs of residents. Um, but it does include a number of um, a set of a basket of indicators, and a number of the, a number of those have been significantly impacted by the pandemic. Um, so we have seen that um, there has been a, an increase in the prevalence of depression, in diabetes, and in violence against the person. Just to take three of those indicators that we know are going in in the wrong direction. Um, Work is, is is continuing around those areas and and and, and we'll be addressing those um, those themes, but that basket of indicators was really there to try and keep an oversight of some of those broader health and well-being issues across the borough. Um, what the board agreed to prior to the pandemic, that as well as focusing on the statutory responsibilities and duties of this board, they would also focus on a rolling annual priority where rather than trying to cover lots of issues, the board would come together to use its collective strengths to um, focus on a particular issue and, and make a concerted effort to, to, to look at how we can learn and work differently and work effectively around a particular issue. Um, so previous topics have included um, community engagement and, and co-production around service models of um, the Wilson Health and Wellbeing Model. 
a whole system approach to tackling diabetes with a really powerful um, diabetes truth um, program and work on childhood obesity. Um, so the aim is to make sure that the, the, that the, uh, the, the members of the board are kind of greater than the sum of their parts and they, they work co collectively together on a particular issue. And what we wanted to do tonight was um, focus on um, two issues that you might want to consider as a rolling priority going forward. Um, and those would be underpinning some of the sort of key outcomes of the health and well-being strategy, which are promoting when mental health and well-being, making healthy choices easier, and protecting from harm. Um, and as I mentioned, it would also be about um, uh, taking a health at all policies approach. Um, it, earlier this year, uh, uh, sorry, last year, the board received um, a report on the health in all policies approach and, and endorsed that as, as, a, as a way of working. Um, so that is something that, you know, we want to, again, propose that is continued here going forward. Um, so there were two critical issues, really, that we wanted to raise with the board. Um, at this stage, we haven't come with lots of detail and facts and figures. It's really wanting to have a discussion about where the board can have collectively um, the, the, the most impact by focusing in a sort of concentrated way on, on, a, on a topic. So the first option was um, tackling air, air pollution, tobacco, smoking, and respiratory disease together. So this would be about obviously building on some of the conversation we've just had around smoking, trying to take a, a whole systems approach to um, tackling air, to, to those issues working together. So that would be very much looking at the protecting people from harm and making healthy choices easier themes of the health and wellbeing strategy. And it could bun bundle together a number of kind of exciting um, initiatives and, and programs that are happening across the borough, including um, the work around Beat the Streets, the development of low traffic neighborhoods, um, super zones around schools and um, a work that we're aiming to do around looking at um, children living with asthma and air quality. Um, it could also address some of the issues and, and shine a spotlight on the work around smoking cessation in housing in, and in vaping as we've, we've just had that conversation. So that was that was option A. Um, and the other option, option B, another very critical issue was around healthy workforce and workplace health. Um, and again, this is very much um, tied into our COVID recovery work um, around priorities for promoting uh, mental well-being and making healthy choices easier. Um, so we know there are um, significant uh, workplace health issues and uh, workplace well-being issues that have um, become uh, more um, sort of severe since the pandemic. Um, and we know that re recruitment and retention in health and care is a priority um, for the ICB, the Integrated Care Partnership, and um, the local authority as well. Um, we know that there are a huge number of, of days lost. I mean, pre-pandemic, there were 131 million working days lost due to sickness, and that is likely to have increased po post-pandemic. Um, and we know there are lots of opportunities for working collaboratively to um, promote healthier workforce and healthy workplace that also link with um, promoting environmental sustainability. So particularly thinking around active travel for health, um, well-being for staff, patients and residents um, linked to some of the work around um, climate change. Um, so I'm going to pause there. I'm going to hand over to Barry and then perhaps we'll come back and um, open it up for, for a discussion about those two options. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, so in addition to that rolling priority that the Health and Being Board um, decides for us to focus on, there are two programmes of work uh, where the, the board's uh, engagement, promotion and oversight will be really helpful to continue. 
So the first of these is actively Merton and the Borough of Sport. Clearly, we've made some fabulous first steps in our journey for actively Merton and the Borough of Sport, but there's very much more we can do. We're focusing on children and young people and their families at the moment through Beat the Streets. We want to work with uh, the, the other end of the age group, so working to help the older people to live longer, better. So again, there's some really strong physical activity programs that we can produce for older people. Um, and that clearly has a really strong overlap with the council priority to be a borough of sport. And the second one is around the, the, the really strong work we've done uh, across the uh, across Merton and partners uh, across the NHS local authority and with the voluntary sector on social prescribing. We've got a fabulous uh, primary care network uh, social prescribing program uh, led by Merton Connected. Um, and we've also got some really innovative pilot programs around green social prescribing, children and young people social prescribing and winter fit. So uh, some social prescribing led by our community pharmacy colleagues across Southwest London. So we're evaluating those those programs and it gives us uh, some real strength to continue that, that, that work, embedding public health risk factors as we've kind of spoken about before. So our next steps for the decision that the, the board make, we will then come back with an outlined partnership work program um, for implementation to the next board. Um, so perhaps now I can hand back to Councillor McCabe. Thank you. Well, I, I think we should just open it up and hear what people have got to say in terms of priorities. Who wants to kick off? Jennifer, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, on uh, page 27, on your new priority be healthy workforce and workplace, I was wondering whether we should be looking at paying the London living wage for care staff within that. Should that um, work be included here? Would that be possible? Julie? In trouble. Oh, here we go. Um, um, yes, that could could be tied in. I suppose what we are proposing at the moment is that the board probably identifies one of the two options as their priority going forward, because I think in the past okay. we've it's it's been felt that there's more um, impact if we focus on one issue. So we're not we're, we're suggesting that you, you you identify one, and it may be that one comes first and the other follows, but but I but we think that would probably have more impact. Um, but certainly the, the living wage is, a, is definitely a factor in terms of work, workforce, health and well-being. My own view on this is that um, there are increasing numbers of people who are committing to paying the London living wage. Uh, our colleagues in the NHS have, have already done so. Um, the council has done so. Uh, when we are letting contracts, we are in, sort of making that a condition. and. Um, if you look around and see that supermarkets have, have um, in some cases, um, given their employees two or three increases in the in the last twelve months, that tells you that the economy is is kind of moving and the shortage of labour is going to compel people. Um, and I don't know if John would like to add anything to that. Um, around um, um, the London living wage, um, the borough are going out to um, procurement for our home care contracts in the next year. So we'll be paying all of our home care staff um, the London living wage. It's the biggest contract the adult social care has, about £10 million a year we, we spend on that. Can I just come in through to the, because I, I had my hand up, um, the options are both, I mean, how do you distinguish between them? They're both really worthy. And how do you think distinguish? But I'm always a believer that you start at home and do your own, you get your own house in order before you do some other things. We've got 1,800 staff working in the council. St George's, 15,000 perhaps staff working in St George's. How many people in primary care? How many thousands? All of them will be driving, or a lot of them might be driving, a lot of them might not be using active um, 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 transport. For me, it would be option B, and then move on to the 
um, option A. There's so much work going on with option A already. For me, you would start with option B um, and start with our, with our huge workforce in the voluntary sector, adults who care, health. Um, oh. Thank you, John. Um, uh, you know, but tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to challenge John on it, actually, because uh, we have identified across the ICP that workforce would be a priority. And I wonder whether under uh, priority B, we are going to do that anyway as a collective across Southwest London. And, and we will have a merit and implementation plan to that, that wider strategy. So I, I was kind of based on the last conversation, I was the, I was heading for priority A rather than priority B, because I think we'll do priority B anyway. Um, I, I do agree with, you know, both of your points. I do think equally both are as important um, as each other. However, I do think as a challenging point to point B, um, based on all the work I've done with obviously young people, um, a lot of them have said, you know, one of the key priorities is broad health and well-being. Hence why, you know, the project that we started originally under 18 COVID champions, it has shifted into health and well-being. Hence why I do think, you know, tackling air pollution, tobacco smoking, and respiratory you know diseases is very very important because it goes a lot across a really broad spectrum you know of a, of a lot of you know health health and well-being you know issues as I've, as I've mentioned before um and i do think you know when we look at health healthy workforce and workplace it's also important to think about the age group that we're targeting you know um and and that's why i would say you know my favorite is option a the whole um system approach just because even from my work I do you know I work with a lot of under 18s and I, and I do think that is really relevant to their obviously age group and you know you know their issues that they're encountering for example vaping the discussion we had about that um and you know not even just that broader broader sorry mental health for example depression looking at different aspects of it for instance um you know the survey that we've conducted a lot of young people have said um you know that in terms of their current priorities they're very broad for instance they said that you know rather than looking at mental health they really want to look at the individual factors of it you know and and that's why i do think you know option you know a that whole um system approach we can do a lot of crossover work to be honest with their um health and well-being priorities um and that's why i'm a strong advocate on option a however i i do take your point to be honest um, because healthy workforce and workplace is relevant, as I said, to young people, depending on their age, depending, you know, the key milestones where they are. Um, just like, for example, me, I'm 21. You know, my priority would be both equally, but, you know, that healthy um, workforce is also important to me at the same time. Um, but, yeah, that, that's the point I just wanted to add. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm I'm going to advocate for... A, um, my view on that is someone who personally suffers with severe respiratory disease, been asthmatic since I was a child. There was no real initiatives around uh, reducing cars around schools. Um, I grew up in inner London and pollution was always very poor. And I think um, this council um, is unashamed of the work they've done around schools, not only to ensure road safety, but to improve air quality around schools. And we do lots of mitigation. Now, a lot of that we can't control. Um, we're a small council. The good thing is London generally pulls in the right direction, but there are lots of things, um, pollution that comes in from other areas that we can't control. But we certainly can mitigate what our young people and people generally are breathing in that's causing a lot of this respiratory disease one. I know we've had a long discussion about tobacco previously. Um, also, we do know it is changing behaviour. So while school streets initiative and low traffic networks are unpopular, and we get um, a bit of grief about those, uh, we do know it changes behaviour. Compliance um, initially is low, and when people start getting hit in the pocket, um, compliance improves significantly. Um, and there are lots of other things we can do to change drivers' behaviours to 
move to active travel and to move to more sustainable uh, and uh, greener methods of traveling. So as a whole systems approach um, for those reasons, uh, certainly with my regulators hat on and also responsible for air quality in the borough, I'd certainly go for option A. Well, I'm going to be controversial and I just think, uh, well, it sounds like there's a lot of overlap and we've been told, I suppose, on both sides that we're already doing quite a lot of this work. So why don't we do both of them? They overlap. There's active travel as part of the healthy workforce and workplace. We certainly are already doing that piece of, already be doing that piece of work. We're already doing quite a lot in the tackling air. Why don't we do both? So just... Just one more point, as I am here representing the executive director who couldn't be here today, um, the new executive leadership team coming in and the new uh, executive director, I know he personally is very uh, passionate around staff using more sustainable methods of transport. So I think the second part will happen organically, just part as part of our own people plans anyway. Um, it's going to be controversial in, in some areas and, and, and there are certainly some professions that rely a lot on their own vehicles but I think um I think yes we could do both but I think actually B may happen organically just from the discussions I know we've been having departmentally bye thank you um I think this is really difficult isn't it I mean they're both I think you can make compelling arguments for both priorities can't you um pragmatically if South West and ICS are providing capacity to implement healthy workplace across all sectors then it would seem reasonable to prioritize a um, given the the wider system impact that could have um, alongside the knowledge that we know that b is being delivered it, that could technically mean that we are actually prioritizing both as a partnership but it's just how they're being delivered thank you jennifer Thank you, Peter. Yes, um, both would be fantastic, obviously, um, but they do combine. Um, my priority would be for A as well because of the climate um, strategy, and I think that involves B. I think I think it would end up that we would be working. They would end up being working together. I think both A and B would be combined. If we got if we got A right, I think we'd get B on this way. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I. Um, are there any other people who haven't yet spoken who want to contribute to this? No? Laura? Um, I think, as I said, you can make a compelling argument for both. It's a bit like being asked to choose your favourite child out of these two. I think they'd be brilliant, and I'd like to like to see us focus on both. Um, I I agree with John's point that um, you start with getting your own house in order and looking after the people that are looking after others, um, and whether that's in health or care or in the council. That's what a lot of our workforce have dedicated their careers to, and they're having a really difficult time in some cases. So I think their well-being is absolutely a priority. Um, however, I also believe there is already a lot of work underway with that, and that we could make that part of option A. Beat the street is a great example. I mean, I've got people in my surgery who say to me, oh, I walked an extra 15 minutes to get this uh, beat box this morning. So you see that the things that we do to support our residents and patients also support our workforce, and particularly where those are one and the same, because so many of the people that work with us in health and care uh, will also live in the borough. Um, so, and and I suppose I'm, the final thing that sways me is hearing Anna's passion for option A, because I think knowing what engages and connects with our young people should be something we're really listening to, because um, I think that will help us to move this forward and, and gain their kind of trust and support that we're doing the things that support their health priorities as well. So... Uh, but both excellent. If we could do both, I would love to see that. If I had to cast my decision, I would elect for option A. I like the um, talk about choosing your favourite child. Uh, my children uh, consistently say that uh, that 
other siblings are the favourite, and uh, but there's there's no no agreement there either. As indeed, I think we've we found the scene, and we're about as um, split as the Scottish National Party. I think today, um, Julia, are you going to help us out here with a, a really uh, uh, amazing suggestion? <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm, I'm not sure how amazing it will be. Um, I mean, it's great to hear what everybody has to say about these two, you know, really important issues and and how kind of passionate everybody is about about them. Um, uh, so so it's really you know good to hear that that engagement. What I was going to suggest was that I agree with Laura's point that 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 I think the priority a would will actually bring in elements of workforce particularly around active travel physical activity so i was going to suggest that if we could go away and um come back with a with a with a kind of proposal with a plan that actually brought in that element so they were they, they were linked um with a with a focus on a but bringing in those elements of workforce um that might, around physical activity so would that would that is a bit of a compromised position but would that keep members of the board happy if we uh, if we tried that well i think the alternative is that we have to start having a vote and uh, it could go to my casting vote which would be uh, unfortunate i think that's a cunning plan you've you've described it as a compromise i think it's a cunning plan um so perhaps what we should do is ask you to go away and undertake that work. And indeed, the recommendations do say that there will be um, a further report to the next meeting of the board and that, you know, you've had clear indications of what people are thinking um, and there are, you know, divisions uh, if people are asked to choose, but um, maybe we can weave um, some magic and, and come up with something that will command the support of the majority of people in in the board so um the recommendations are a and b on page um 23 can we agree those and await the cunning plan thank you okay item six is the primary care strategy um, mark you're going to take us through this so over to you okay so um uh just in terms of uh, uh why are we developing a primary care strategy so two reasons really uh one uh people's needs have changed um and we are seeing different demands on primary care but actually just on some of the conversations we've had tonight uh there are opportunities in primary care around prevention uh, and we know that there are areas of concern uh, uh, from our residents and our populations around things like access. So we wanted to pull that together. And that's across southwest London. I'm sure Sai and Laura will also uh, touch upon that we will have a Merton plan around kind of implementing this strategy as well. Um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, we have the best outcomes possible for the people of, uh, of Merton and southwest London. We want people to stay well. We want to wrap care around individuals that need it and make it a kind of seamless provision of care across disciplines. And also we want to make sure that we streamline access so people can get the right care from the right professional at the right time. That's not always a GP. And uh, we've talked about the, some of the new roles that are in primary care. It's about really maximizing the opportunity we have there. Now, some services might be at a practice level, some might be at a PCN level, and some might be at a borough level. And then you're really specialist, might even be on that, it might be at a South West London level. But predominantly, we're talking about neighbourhood teams in Merton and having like really uh, those services delivered at a community level. Uh, we did a workshop in November and three main themes came out, uh, prevention, proactive care and improving access. So going back to our smoking cessation conversation, making every contact count across a number of domains, not just smoking, things like we've talked about obesity, diabetes, making sure that actually we're all pulling in that same direction in primary care as well. Uh, proactive care, multidisciplinary teams, so less handoffs between organisations and disciplines, more about the personalised care of an individual, and then access, uh, get, uh, as I said. Uh, these will depend on four key 
uh, areas. Workforce, we've got to make sure that we have the right workforce to deliver. We'll have to have a, uh, there's work to do with residents around expectations of workforce. So many times we talk to people and they'll say, we want to see a GP. Well, actually, you don't often, you don't always have to see a GP. You can see a pharmacist, you could see a paramedic, et cetera. So we have to uh, also uh, not just uh, make sure that our workforce are well supported, as, uh, as Laura and Sai were saying earlier, but actually that we're also advertising and promoting what those uh, new services can deliver. Digital. Uh, we'll talk about digital access. Um, it's really important that people have digital access, but we also have to recognise that not everyone has digital access. And so it's about a multi-channel approach. And then IT. Um, uh, we need to make sure that our primary care physicians and uh, clinicians have the right IT support to do the job. And that's really, really important. We see day after day challenges with infrastructure, which we have to address. And then finally, estates. Have we got the right buildings in the right place, in the right state to provide great care? Uh, there's some slides there around what it means for patients. I've mentioned about uh, a, a range of disciplines, really looking after people, particularly those that have got long term conditions, mental health, and those that are entering into kind of older age and frailty. We see that those are really important cohorts of patients that we need to care for, as well as children. And it goes back to that preventative nature. We've got We've got children, we should be really uh, making sure that we're delivering services to them and, and promoting um, uh, well-being through it. South West London does have really good primary care. Yeah, and we have to make sure that everyone knows that we, we score really well in the GP survey um, in top four in the country. And Merton are a great example of primary care. I think uh, across South West London, we have the only outstanding practice. But actually, we have brilliant GPs who do brilliant work and brilliant practices out there. What we want to do is build on that. Uh, we have done a self-assessment already. Uh, we know that multidisciplinary teams do uh, exist. They exist in Merton. What we want to do is make sure that they have the right people in them for the right cohorts of patients. So we want to enhance that as we go through the next uh, few months. Um, we know that we're delivering a record number of appointments uh, in terms of in primary care, and that continues to grow on a monthly basis. But what we need to check is, are we doing the right number of face-to-face -face appointments versus the right number of digital consultations to the right number of other consultations by other disciplines? Uh, prevention, and again, we want to promote self-management through digital. We want to ensure that in diabetes, we are making sure that every uh, contact counts, but that we're also doing the right programs about weight management, exercise, et cetera. So what I've basically given you today is a kind of uh, absolute whirlwind through what the strategy hopes to achieve. But what we wanted to ask the health and well-being boards is prevention, proactive care, self, uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams, and access are those the right areas of, for us to focus on. When we talk about prevention, what do we mean? We know we're talking about diabetes, smoking cessation, but have we missed anything? Is there anything that we should be really doing? And also to get some feedback just on what does good access look like and what does good care feel like? Now, those are quite broad questions, so I don't expect everyone to come up with answers straight away. Uh, I, I'm happy for people to kind of take this away and think about it and drop me a line. We're doing a number of engagements across the board, like Health Watch, et cetera, um, and which we've already started to do. Uh, but we really do want the, the, the strategy to also address health inequalities. And, uh, and that's a really strong thing that we want to make sure uh, we achieve. So it was to bring it here as an introduction to the strategy. Uh, and to get health and well-being uh, members kind of feedback and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, well, we're we're being asked to comment uh, on areas of focus and improvement. So, over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Peter. At the last Healthier Communities uh, overview and scrutiny panel, we heard about uh, cancer screening and how bad the IT systems were 
and they said they'd had to return to using paper because it was so outdated. Is there any update or provision for, for that being improved? I think that's part of why we've identified the IT infrastructure and the tools for people to do the right job is really essential. And I think yeah, uh, what we need to do is uh, really talk to experts about what is, what is the best IT infrastructure that we can have. We can, on a daily basis, you can you know book a flight, you can buy a car, you can basically talk to all your mates. Then then we go into primary care and we have to wind up the computer for 45 minutes before it actually works that that's really outdated what we want to do in the strategy uh, is make sure that we are prioritizing that and try to make sure we people have got the right tools to do the job and that includes cancer care any others julia Thank you, um, and thank you, Mark. It was very good to, to sort of hear about the uh, about the strategy. I, I think I, I'm particularly interested in the 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 sort of development of neighbourhood teams and the neighbourhood model. And I'd be there. Are obviously, you know, I want very keen to see how how that then integrates and works with other teams and, and and other things happening across the borough. So I'm thinking particularly, for example, the development of the family hub model. Um, and um, you know the the alignment of of, of of health visitors and other other wider kind of community um, community staff. So I, I'm very interested to see kind of what impact that would have and what benefit that would have. Particularly, I'm obviously my interest in in, in families, um, and then also very keen that prevention is there. That's fantastic. As as you all you know, one of your three top three priorities. That's really great to see. Um, as Barry mentioned earlier, we are. Um, developing we are a um, social prescribing pilot for young people um, which is being piloted in East Merton TCN and we've got um, very pleased we've got funds from the inequalities funds to roll that out to a further PCN so again very keen to when we get to the stage see see you know how we can you know we're evaluating that how we can take that forward um, and 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 have that you know, in the same way adults has, has kind of moved to the mainstream, what are the opportunities there for young people's services? Thank you. Um, Brian. Ask uh, probably Si and Laura just to comment on, I think, what the power of multidisciplinary team working can, can feel like on the ground. Um, but before that, I think just in terms of you've mentioned a number of uh, things like hubs and health visiting and district nursing. And I think one, one of the things that we have suffered from, uh, and not particularly in Merton, but generally, is that <clears throat> it's multiple organisations doing their bit around, around the individual. And what we need to move to is where actually we're sharing records, we're sharing information there and then and it's accessible across the board but also that we're not handing people off between services and those services are truly integrated now that might mean shared teams it might mean shared locations it might mean shared posts etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's what we need to work through and the Merton multidisciplinary team in the east of the borough might look slightly different from the west of the borough. It might look different if there's a predominance of children in the children's hub. We might do that on a slightly different scale. We do do lots of multidisciplinary team working already, but I think it's taking that next step. So it's not about me and you working in different organisations. It's about us working in one team. But Laura, do you want, like, Sai, Laura? Do you want can to we let Sai go first? Because all night I've been asking Laura because she's sat in front of me and, and I feel I've neglected you, Sai. So um, I'm going to let you kick off. Not not at all. I mean, Laura is wonderful, isn't she? So um, I think in terms of um, the strategy, I think it's important to understand that the primary care strategy is not a strategy in isolation. Um, and, and to deliver improved outcomes for local residents it's about how we work together and it's primary care's role within that so I think I think that's the key point really and when you think about integrated neighborhood teams it's a nexus of 
providers and people from all sectors working together with local residents, local communities to do just that. So I think what we need to try and understand is actually how do we connect the dots, connect people and teams to then achieve that vision. And it's about building on what's existing and that, that's going to take time. perhaps just to pick up Mark's point about what it feels like working on the ground in multidisciplinary teams I said one of the things that struck me when I attended the South West London event to participate in the production of this strategy was actually what a great foundation we've got in Merton of that you know multidisciplinary uh, working through our integrated locality teams which are, are well established and have a focus particularly on frailty so they bring together partners to talk about the most complex frail or end of life um, patients, but they're currently operating at a sort of practice-based level. Well, actually, we could work at more of a neighbourhood PCN level. You'd have some advantages of scale, which might enable you to then bring in different partners and to work differently with our secondary care colleagues and to make that even more of a, um, a rich multidisciplinary discussion, but to also to, to smooth out those transitions between a patient who's in hospital and who's in the community, whose needs might be changing, whose acuity of illness might be moving up and down. By having all those partners in one place, when you discuss that patient on a regular basis, you know that the right people are there to put in place the, the care or the additional clinical input that, that might be, be needed. I think um, Julia's point about family hubs as a model for neighbourhood team working is really interesting and really exciting. I think the work around children and young people social prescribing in Merton um, provides a good foundation for that as well. But there are also pilots going on in Morden PCN where they've done some work uh, with the voluntary sector and with their residents and patients to find out exactly what it is that people need that can help them access um, healthcare services better. So I think joining up those teams is, a, is another real opportunity. And I think Mark's right that the, the teams want to reflect the health needs of the neighbourhood that they serve. And so they might be slightly different and we will need to pilot some things perhaps in different areas to then find out what we roll out across the borough and what, what, what works really well. But I think we're building from a strong foundation and I think there is an opportunity um, to what's to to use those challenges of IT and estates and workforce as also enablers of driving that more integrated working um, wrapped around patients. Thank you. Jennifer. Yeah, just looking at the slide, I'm just um, interested to know where uh, dentistry and opticians come in, or would they all be included as well with this? So uh, they will be part of the strategy, um, uh, but I think what we need to do is the delegated authority for commissioning those comes to the ICB on the 1st of April, um, and I will be the SRO for that for the, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think what we need to do is we need to ensure that we really understand what the challenges are in each of those areas and what the opportunities are. And I know that, you know, dentistry um, often is raised, as, as, as we do know, in southwest London, we've got some access issues around dentistry and we've got some quality issues. But we've also got issues with the national contract and actually why do dentists not necessarily want to pick up? Uh, NHS contracts anymore so I think there's a although it will be mentioned in the primary care strategy I think there will be another piece of work a little bit further down the line when we know more about uh, where we stand and what the actions are and Karen yes thank you um just picking up on um both Julia and Laura's point. Karen, could, would you mind introducing yourself, sir? Oh, of course. Hello. I'm Karen Worthington. I'm a GP in Merton. Um, I'm also the name GP for Child Safeguarding in Merton. So I wanted to pick up on um, Julia and Laura's points, um, particularly in relation to children and young people. Um, I think um, where we could po possibly strengthen things is actually closer working um, with um, schools and children's centres within our proposed um, neighbourhood teams. I think that would be really beneficial. Um, and another opportunity would be around multi-professional training at PCN level, particularly in relation to children and young, pe young people. Um, 
Julia asked about health visiting. We do have health visitors linked to specific practices. Um, and that's obviously particularly important in um, child safeguarding work. Um, so that, that I just want to share that extra bit in, um, um, in relation to the strategy where I think we could um, strengthen um, our, our uh, multi-professional working. Thank you, Karen. Any other comments, Anna? Um, just a minor point that I just wanted to add in. Um, I think when it comes to like work in terms of children and young people, I think one of the key areas that we should focus on, in, especially in terms of engagement, is inclusivity. I'll be very honest, because I think that, you know, working with young people can be very difficult. You know, it can range from, you know, the background they're from. And I feel like, you know, if we focus on that inclusivity aspect, we can do so much in such a small space amount of time. And I, and I do think that, you know, when it comes to, you know, work like this, or, you know, you know, the social prescribing work that I do, along with the public health team, you know, inclusivity is such a big thing we focus on, focus on, and especially, you know, in terms of um, broader health and well-being, and, and that's why I just wanted to advocate this point, because it's such a big thing, you know, especially the work I do, you know, a lot of young people say that they want to feel inclusive, and sometimes, um, you know, when they speak to adults, they don't feel like adults, you know, necessarily touch that point of inclusivity, so, so that's why I just wanted to, you know, really stress, you know, the point of, you know, in terms of any work we do with children, young people, you know, appreciating the differences. And I'm sure, you know, work covers that, but just re-emphasizing that point, you know, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's an important point. Yes, sorry. Forgive me. Dave Curtis, Head of Health Watch Merton. It was purely to add around the IT and around having wraparound services that actually a lot of um delays come from our refer referral pathways and processes that we have in place especially when you've got different partners and it's a and even though decisions can be made quickly actually the delay in the information flow comes from those for me from those referral process that's what a lot of um, the feedback comes back so it's would it be about also looking at how to simplify that across partners and have agreements in where and how that in information can flow back and forth and how ref from referral to approval to being seen can kind of speed up Mark, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, they're really, they're, without being flippant about it, I, you know, I think one of the the things around IT and shared records, etc. And I'm looking at Laura because and, and Karen because we we're working through an issue at the moment, or well, they're working through an issue at the moment. So I think absolutely, the more that we can streamline and simplify our, our systems across partners, the better. Yeah. Uh, that said, we will always have things like IG data that we have to, you know, we have to, you know, uh, protect people's confidentiality, etc. We have to do things in the right way. But there are certainly real opportunities for us to, to make our systems talk to each other and be much more effective. OK, I think we've given that a good airing. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so um, this one. Uh, uh, the recommendation is uh, on page 33, and we're asked to note the development of the strategy uh, and comment on areas of focus and improvement. I think we have done that. So can we agree that recommendation? Thank you. So item seven is the ICB draft joint forward plan. Um, and Mark is going to lead us on this. This appears on page 45 of our agenda. Um, so, uh, Mark, off you go. Thank you, Chair. And I can hear you all groan, oh, God, not another plan. Uh, but why is the Joint Forward Plan different? Well, the Joint Forward Plan, firstly, is a requirement. So it's a statutory requirement for the NHS to submit a plan that's a five-year plan that gets refreshed annually. The difference this year is that we're asking partners to actually just comment on it and make sure that it reflects uh, some of their priorities as well. The paper sets out basically kind of uh, why we're doing it um, and what we're asking the Health and Wellbeing Board is uh, in the final version and in the draft version to kind of just comment on that it will be inclusive of their, uh, of their uh, priorities. And so therefore the previous conversation kind of almost answers what we need to do, because I think what we need to then reflect back to the ICP 
um, and the ICB is that actually it needs to include those four priority areas. And that's that that's uh, mountains priorities, and we want to make sure that that's reflected somewhere in the in the strategy. Uh, so I think we've almost answered our homework question there. Uh, we are running this concurrently around uh, uh, alongside the, the 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 ICP strategy that we mentioned. Uh, we did bring that to the last um, uh, health and well-being board. But just to say that the ask is actually uh, for the Health and Wellbeing Board to comment on what it wants to see as their priority areas in the joint forward plan from a Merton Health and Wellbeing uh, perspective. The document also sets out the many uh, categories and uh, chapters that will be written up and then published. Uh, publication is by the end of June, but we will have a draft pretty much ready by the end of this week as well. Um, and so therefore it will set out areas such as our ambition, what our parent, patients tell us, well, how we're going to meet the, the, the clinical outcomes and the targets and performance that as an NHS, we are set out to do such as the a and &E four hour delivery target. So it is very much focused on the NHS uh, targets and responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> The action is basically uh, for me to ask Health and Wellbeing Board to support us in the delivery of this statutory obligation and requirement, and then just for us to, to uh, kind of take into account the health and wellbeing strategy conversation, and that perhaps that I write that conversation up and feed it back from this board as the board's feedback. Um, and also for us to, to revisit the joint forward plan between now and June with the Health and Wellbeing Board partners. So does anyone want to comment on this um, or um, identify any local priorities at this stage? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I guess, um, as you said, writing up the previous conversation is really helpful. But looking at the second slide, I, it just really welcome the range of themes within there about green and environmental concerns, voluntary and community sector capacity, support to carers. So it wasn't just looking at those clinical outcomes. It was about connecting with communities and things that we are interested in as a health and wellbeing board. So we're just reflecting that it was really welcome to see those themes. Any other comments? John? I I also agree with the second slide. The only thing that I did wonder about was, I mean, the Boris um, uh, key uh, priority around the bar of sport and activity and the work that we're doing around actively Merton and um, the borough committee um, um, uh, uh, to link to the bar of sport. I mean, for me, Prevention is really important, but the work that we're doing in Beat the Street will see the impacts in years to come. So, you know, it's all of these sort of things that we're doing now that will that will prevent people from needing to go to GP surgeries. Because you said it yourself, you wish you hadn't picked up your first cigarette. The minute you picked it up and started smoking, it was too late. I mean, probably years afterwards, you stopped smoking. But it's for me, it's a little bit about that bar of sport and actively marching. Any other comments? Anna? Um, but yeah, um, just to reinforce what I've mentioned previously, um, as I was saying, the, the work we conducted with young people, um, they have said recently that mental health remains the priority. However, the one thing I do want to stress about mental health is ensuring that, you know, every single aspect of mental health is covered, to be quite honest. Um, the reason why I, I, I do say it is because we we conducted qualitative feedback from those young people and they have mentioned, you know, um, for example, eating disorders as a, as a big thing to young people. So that's why I've, you know, mentioned this before, but just ensuring that individual differences are just, you know, covered because it is very important for young people. And that also goes back to my point of, on inclusivity, you know, because it links so closely together. And I'm really happy to see those two elements being on there, um, to be quite honest with you. But yeah, as long as, you know, mental health, healthy eating, 
exercise is is covered then I'm super happy but as I said mental health if it's covered you know broadly but making sure that everything is covered and I'm, I'm going to be very happy because I, I advocate for young people so you know but yeah thank you okay so are there any more I can't see any oh Jane Sorry, and I realised I didn't introduce myself last time either, did I? So, um, Jane McSherry, Executive Director for Children, Lifelong Learning and Families. Um, so the only point I sort of emphasise on the mental health services, so in that diagram, it is very much talking about acute mental health services. It's sort of talking about what we used to call Tier 3, isn't it? As opposed to our wider wellbeing services and access to, um, for example, for young people can, that can refer themselves to access online services. And so um, that there's something about the sort of, um, sort of well-being, early health around mental health that, that perhaps isn't coming across quite strongly. And I know that the CAMS partnership has done a lot of work on on making sure there's that access for young people. So that could be helpful to emphasise. Thank you. You got all that, Mark? Yeah, I have. So, so <clears throat> Jane, I think... Um, so firstly, about the individual, I think you're absolutely right. And so what we need to do is tease out what it what it means for individual patients. Um, I think in terms of the the that may be covered under the preventing ill health around children, but probably what we need to do is be more explicit about that. Um, and if the the board is is agreeable, what I'll do is write up not just this conversation, but a bit about the health and well-being strategy conversation as well and submit that just as a, a kind of like a placeholder whilst we then work it up for the June submission. Yeah. But basically capturing the conversation we've had today. Thank you for that, really helped. Well, in that case, the recommendation there is um, on page 45. Is that agreed? Thank you. And then the final item is the place-based partnership progress and vision. And Mark, you're going to provide us with a, a verbal update on that. So uh, we've got a number of uh, strategies across the board, such as health and well health and well-being, our primary care. We've got the ICP, and actually, the challenge for us now is to make that a reality in Merton. So we've had a number of conversations about uh, integration, and I think it's fair to say that actually, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we work really well as a partnership group. We are a really cohesive partnership group. We need, now need to take that into the next step and actually really start to join up. And a, a little bit about put our money where our mouth is in terms of the integration conversation and the multidisciplinary team conversation that we've just been having. So it's just to say that over the next year, that that's going to be a real focus, certainly for me as the place executive. Um, and I think in terms of not just our infrastructure, uh, but also in the services that we deliver. So we will be reaching across, and I know that my colleagues reach across as well, is that actually to really start trying to make uh, inroads into that integration and make better outcomes for people, remembering that that's what we're here for. It's not necessarily about our organisational structures. It's about are we doing right for the population of Merton? So it's just to say that we are, uh, we are taking this through the borough committee. We will update you uh, as a health and wellbeing board in terms of the progress, we're just having individual conversations at the moment as to what does integration mean uh, for different people. It means different things. So for our acute trust, for instance, I had a conversation today that was very much about the virtual wards. So they want to work with primary and community services in basically making that transition from hospital through discharge back into the community really seamless. That means that for them in terms of integration, but for John, the integration of OTs is a different take. So what we want to do is tease out all the areas we want to integrate on and then have a plan for that integration to happen. So that's probably all I was going to say is that it's very much top prior, one of the top priorities. And we will be working over the next uh, financial year to really make it a reality.
one at the top of many. <laughs> we had this discussion earlier, didn't we? Okay, any questions to Mark or comments on what he's had to say? John, do you want to respond to um, reaching out across the aisle there? We reached out, we've already reached out. I mean, for me, it's my top priority as well, and it is within the year. Um, there's so many areas that we need to work on. I think we need to take it back here probably later in the year, but it is both of our priorities. That unified note, I think we can draw the meeting to a conclusion. I'd like to thank you all for attending, for contributing, uh, for asking the questions and reaching the conclusions that we have. And um, I suggest you take the rest of the evening.